So far, I've talked about the rationale behind formative assessment and some strategies for formative assessment, and then a variety of practical techniques that teachers can use to embed this in their classroom. Uh, that's the easy bit. Uh, I could have talked to you about those, ten, those ideas 10 years ago. Uh, my ideas about what makes a good classroom haven't changed in the last 10 years. What I have learned is just how hard it is to affect these changes in classrooms. So in this final uh, session, I want to talk a little bit about how we can support teachers in changing practice. And the model we're using is shown on slide 42. So we call this model content then process. Some people say that professional learning communities are a good idea. And I don't understand why they would say that. You know, they're a good idea for some things and not a good idea for other things. So the important thing is first decide what you want to help teachers change and then decide how to do it. And so the, the first uh, sessions uh, illustrated the power of formative assessment. So that's the evidence base. Then there's the content. What is formative assessment really? What are the strategies and techniques? But then we need to understand the process of teacher change. And I think there are five components that need to be in place for effective teacher learning. Choice, flexibility, small steps, accountability, and support. And I'll say a bit about each. First, choice. Uh, on slide 44, uh, there's a summary of the work of a man called Meredith Belvin, who in 1980 wrote a book called Management Teams, Why They Succeed or Fail. He worked at Henley Management College, which was involved in training business people. And what they discovered was that when people were given complex problems to solve, when everybody in the group was similar in their attitudes and their approaches to problem solving, the group was usually unsuccessful and the group was far more likely to be successful when the team was full of different people. And he observed people's behaviours in problem-solving sessions and he suggested there were eight different kinds of team roles and they're listed there on the slide. I'm not going to go through them. But he also made two important observations. The first was that each role has key strengths and allowable weaknesses. So people who are very creative are often not very practical, but that's okay, because that's just the other side of the same coin. The other thing he observed was that people rarely sustain out-of-role behavior for very long when they're under pressure. And so what this has led to in business is a focus on what they call strengths-based professional development. The idea that you can contribute more to your company by becoming really great at the things that you're already good at, rather than worrying too much about your weaknesses. In teaching, we haven't got that message yet. We tend to focus on people's weaknesses. It almost seems to me as if professional development is designed to make every single teacher into a clone of every other teacher. And that's just crazy. Teachers are at their best when they are their idiosyncratic, quirky selves. So the ideas about formative assessment that I've talked about earlier will be taken forward by each teacher in their own way. And you know what? You know more about your classroom and your students and your subjects than anybody else on the planet. You are the best place to judge what is going to work best in terms of improving your own practice. And that's why choice is essential as the, as the first of the five process strategies. Giving people choice is essential. Second, flexibility. Um, and slide 46 uh, illustrates our approach to flexibility. The important thing is that we distinguish between strategies and techniques. So the five strategies of formative assessment, sharing learning intentions, eliciting evidence, providing feedback that moves learning forward, activating students as owners of their own learning and as learning resources for one another, those five things are always good things to be doing. There is not a single time when doing that might be a bad idea. But they are very broad, vague strategies. To actually implement them, you have to make them concrete, and we call those things techniques. So the colored cups, match the comments to the essays, all those are practical classroom techniques. But each teacher needs to choose those things very carefully. Some of those will work with some students and not others. Some will work with some subjects and not others. Some will work with some ages and not others. 
So the important thing is that the five strategies always work. They are the no-brainers, if you like. But the techniques need careful choice, and that's why the choice of technique must be left up to the teacher. And that's how we allow teachers to be flexible, while at the same time ensuring that there is some fidelity to the research evidence that suggests that these things are smart things to be doing. So the important thing is that these, these techniques are relevant, feasible, and acceptable in the context of normal classroom work. So it's expected that every teacher will, cha will change these things and make them better. Charlotte Kerrigan, who took comment-only marking and made it into match the comments to the essays, made it better. The teacher who took the green and red discs and made it into the coloured cups made it better. That's absolutely essential in terms of improving one's own classroom practice. Small steps. Why should we allow teachers to go slowly? Well, the answer is because teachers can only change very slowly. Um, David Berliner is a researcher in, in America, has spent a long time looking at teacher expertise, and the, the summary, uh, his conclusions, if you like, are listed on page 48, on slide 48. And what he was surprised to discover was that expertise in teaching looks very similar to expertise in chess. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but teachers who are experts do things in ways that are quite different from novices. And that expertise comes from a really large number of repetitions. I was working with a teacher the other day and she was almost in tears and frustration because she was trying to use no hands up and she was saying to me, every time I ask a question, I always say, does anyone, or has anyone? Every time she asked a question, she invited the kids to raise their hands, even though she was trying to use no hands up. And she said to me, why am I finding it so difficult? We sat down and we worked out she's been teaching 22 years. I estimate that by now she has asked in her classroom half a million questions. When you've done something one way half a million times, doing it a different way is going to be very hard. And that's why teachers appear to be slow to change. Teachers don't resist change, but teachers are slow to change because it's a, not about replacing one kind of technique with another. It's about building new expertise. And you can only build new expertise through a large number of repetitions, and that's why change needs to happen slowly. Expertise in teaching is very complex. It's actually complex in a whole range of domains that are far simpler. Uh, in one study uh, by Klein and Klein, which is shown on slide 49. They prepared six video clips of people doing CPR, and five of the clips were of students learning CPR, and one of the video clips was of an experienced paramedic. And people in the study were shown these six video clips, and they were asked, which of these six people would you want doing CPR on you if you needed it? And what they found was that the, the experts picked the expert 90% of the time. The students, just learning CPR, picked the expert 50% of the time. But the instructors, the people who teach other people how to do CPR, picked the expert only 30% of the time. Spend a moment discussing with a neighbor why you think the instructors so rarely picked the expert paramedic. Okay, so the experiment that Klein and Klein did wasn't actually designed in such a way to be absolutely sure about the reasons for these, for these outcomes, but they concluded that, that what seemed to be happening was that the instructors looked for people who were enacting the rules of CPR that they were teaching, and often that wasn't the experts. Often it was the students where you could see that all the individual steps of CPR were being in, enacted, and experts often didn't follow the rules. What's interesting is that while the experts may well break the rules, they do so in a way that other experts could recognize. That's why 90% of the time the experts picked another expert. And that's the important thing about expertise. You cannot reduce it to words. So on, on, on slide 50, um, I've presented there the, the key to the argument here, which is really the most powerful teacher knowledge is not explicit. It's implicit. And that's why 
I think much of the last 25 years of professional development has been wasted because we have acted as if teachers don't know stuff and therefore what's important is that we tell teachers what they don't know and they'll become better teachers. And in fact, what we need is not to give them new knowledge but to help them change their classroom practices. And the hardest bit is not getting new ideas into people's heads, it's getting the old ones out. And it doesn't happen naturally. If it did, the teachers who are most productive would be the ones with the most experience, and that's just not reliably the case. So what we need to do is to create time and space for teachers, and this is shown on slide 51. We need to create time and space for teachers to reflect on their practice and to learn from mistakes. Now there's no, there's no good thing about making the same mistake over and over again, but there's nothing good about not making any mistakes at all. As Mario Andretti, the Formula One racing driver, used to say, if everything seems under control, you're not going fast enough. And that's why I like Esther Dyson's motto, always make new mistakes. But this was perhaps best summed up by Samuel Beckett, who once in a book called Worstwood Ho wrote, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. And that's what I think we should aim to do as teachers. We will fail as teachers because teaching is so difficult. What we can do is each time we fail, we fail slightly better than we did before. Accountability, the fourth process strategy. Why is this so important? Well, what we've discovered is that making people accountable for promising to a group of their colleagues that they're going to change stuff about their practice seems to be very powerful. And our recipe for action planning is listed on slide 53. And there's a whole list of things that are important there. It's, it's, yes, action planning is about being concrete and making a commitment. It makes you crystallize what it is you want to say. Um, makes you focus on a small number of changes. Um, our experience is that if teachers try to change more than two or three things at the same time in their practice, they will actually fail. And so the idea of making the change small, and then, and, and not to be ignored, not to be forgotten about, is this really important idea of deciding what you're going to do less of to make way. Most teachers cannot work any harder than they're working right now. And therefore, to improve, you have to take something off your plate before you put anything on. This is not about working harder, it's about working smarter. It's a very trite phrase, and the messy reality is that because you're a good teacher already, everything you're doing will be good. So you won't get any better by stopping doing bad things because you aren't doing any. So the difficult point about this is that you can only get better by stopping doing good things to give yourself time to be even better. And the fifth um, strategy is support. So we've got choice, flexibility, small steps and accountability. And we also need to make sure that teachers are supported. And I think that the um, the, the, the key roles of teachers and, uh, and, and their leaders are very clear here. I think it's important that every teacher accepts the need to get better, not because they're not good enough, but because they can be even better. So every teacher should be seeking to improve their practice. And because schooling is so important for young kids, um, then I think we should be focusing on the things that make a difference to kids. So frankly, it's self-indulgent to be spending time doing things that might help kids when we know what will. So I think we have to focus on formative assessment. The job of the leader is to create that environment where everybody expects to improve, keeping the focus on the things that matter, but then to create time, space and support for innovation and also to support teachers in taking risks. If teachers aren't taking risks, then there's unlikely to be any deep professional learning. And we found that the best way to create this kind of environment is in something that we call teacher learning communities. And, the, and the, what we've learned in the last 10 years of working on this problem is encapsulated in slide 56. So what we've learned is that this really needs to run for two years. Um, one year isn't enough to embed this in. We think the optimum group size is about 10 to 12. You need enough people to create enough differences of opinion to get good discussions going. But it needs to be small enough so that everybody is accountable for reporting back. We thought at one time it would be helpful to have subject specialists together in secondary schools and early years teachers together in one group and teachers of older students together in another group in primary schools. We actually don't see any clear evidence that that's beneficial. 
So, so how the group is made up doesn't seem to be very important. What does seem to be very important is that the group needs to be monthly. We've tried different frequencies and they don't work as well. And the meetings need to be at least 75 minutes long. So monthly meetings of 75 minutes seem to be optimum. Between lessons, time for teachers to plan together, for example, to think of really high quality questions or to observe each other in their classrooms. There's also, um, of course, leaders need to be aware that uh, some of the ideas that teachers might want to pursue about stopping grading, for example, might conflict with school policies, and so there may be a need to get a waiver from the school's current practice. My advice to leaders on this is, why not sanction this as an experiment and then require the people who are trying the new ideas out to report back to see whether there's evidence that the school policy needs to be changed. In terms of the structures of these meetings, we think it's very helpful to have exactly the same structure for every single meeting. And the structure that we think is the best we've come up with so far is shown in slide 57. So the idea is that every monthly meeting of the teacher learning community starts off with a warm-up activity. There's, uh, there's, there's an introduction. Some have got a starter activity to get things you know, going and to start people talking. The active ingredient is activity three, the feedback. Every teacher in the group reports back to the group about what they've tried and how it went. And they get support from the others, not telling them what to do, because the idea is that each person brings in their own plan. This is not about telling people what to do. This is each person coming with a plan and getting support of others in carrying it out. But to create some variety in Activity 4, we suggest there's always some new learning about formative assessment. So, for example, you might do a book study and read a chapter of a book a month, or you might watch some videos of practice. It's up to the, each group to decide how they're going to fill these, these um, slots up. But the important thing is there's, there's something new at every meeting to make something fresh, because otherwise it gets a bit stale. And then 15 minutes for personal action planning, which seems like quite a long time. But we think it's really important that teachers plan in detail what they're going to commit to doing over the coming month. And then Activity 6 is always a wrap-up. Did we achieve our aims for this meeting? If yes, great. If no, what should we do about it? Now, every, this group needs a leader, and the, the duties of the leader are laid out on slide 57, 58. Um, of course, they need to organize the meeting, they need to ensure that catering is provided, and all the rest of the things. But what's interesting is that we think it doesn't help for that person to be an expert in formative assessment. Indeed, we think that when the person leading the group believes themselves to be an expert in formative assessment, there is less teacher learning because they end up telling others what to do. So we think it's most helpful if the person leading the group is good at chairing, is good at, with, in terms of interpersonal skills, but isn't the expert on formative assessment. This is not experts telling non-experts what to do. This is expert teachers coming together to get support for what it is that they want to do in their own classrooms. And finally, a quick word about peer observation. Peer observation is a very powerful process, but in many schools and districts, it's got perverted into a process where bosses check up on subordinates. And so on slide 59, we've developed a protocol for genuine peer observation. So if somebody comes into my classroom, I tell them what to look for. I'm working on my wait time. I tell them that I would like the observer to measure my wait times, and I give them a stopwatch. And here's the clincher. Any notes they make in my classroom belong to me because when they're in my classroom, they're working for me. And when I'm in their classroom, I'm working for them. And by making it clear that the person being observed is the person who owns the process, then this seems to uh, assuage a lot of the concerns that many people have about peer observation as being a creeping form of performance management. So just to help you absorb this and reflect it, I would like you now to think about... Um, what are the forces in your school, your district, or your state that will actually support this development? What are the things that will drive the adoption of these kinds of practices? And make a list of those on the left-hand side of a sheet of paper. And on the right-hand side in your group, um, what are the minuses? What are the things that are going to get in the way of adopting these practices? Okay. Um, obviously, I can't know what it is that you've discussed in your groups, but I will say one thing. I, I will guarantee that many of the groups, as a minus, have written time.
as a problem. Uh, people say, we haven't got time to do this. And my response is very simple. Yes, you do. You're just currently spending it on something else. Time is not a constraint, it's a resource. The realization you need to make is that you will be able to do this if you stop doing something else you're already doing. And here's the hard part. The thing you're going to have to stop doing is a good thing, but may not be as good as investing in your own professional learning. Stephen Covey talks about coming across a, a man in a, in a forest trying to cut, cut through a log of wood with a blunt saw. And he asks the man, why don't you sharpen the saw? And he says, I haven't got time. That's the trap we've created for ourselves. We need to invest in our own professional development in order to really embrace the power of formative assessment. Thank you.